reintroduce yourself and you can uh, tell us uh, tell us where you're from, what code group you're part of, if we don't already know you, but it looks like we, I don't know, I kind of know everybody. Hmm. Okay. Well, right, the, yeah. only, the person that I'm thinking is probably the newest is Char. But okay. I think, does everybody know Char? Char, do you know folks or do you need uh, us to go through quick? Well, I see your names on there. <laughs> so I've only right on. been in the Zoom, I think one. Um, I missed uh, one or two. And I am the co-leader with Diane Harris for the Westview Meadows. Okay, great. Great. So great. great to have you. Great. That's great. Um, well, okay, why don't we zip on into announcements then? Um, Wait, we uh, have one other new person, Aaron. Aaron. Can you introduce yourself? And mm -hmm. Aaron Wright. Hello. Yes. Hi. Tell us about yourself. I'm Aaron Wright. I am the executive director at the Bishop's Ranch, and I'm the I'm new as a cop leader for the West Side Cop Group. So glad to be okay, here. Great, welcome. That's terrific, terrific. Thanks. And uh, Steve, we're going to hear more from Steve or about Steve, I think, a little later. So that's good because yeah. they're a spotlight. So, um, all right, um, announcements. Uh, first of all, I wanted all of you to know that the city of Healdsburg has new evacuation zones. Um, they have simplified uh, the numbering and uh, reduced the number of zones from 41 to 13. <laughs> so I think that's that's pretty darn good. Um, you can look up your zone by going to the city of Healdsburg's uh, website and you can look under emergency management and then there's a little tool where you can you can type in your address and it will show you what what zone you're in. So, you know, if you didn't know that, be sure and and um, and take that down and be sure that the folks in your COPE group, if you're in Healdsburg, uh, know that uh, they have new zones. This only affects Healdsburg, by the way. It's not, this isn't like a Northern County wide uh, situation or it doesn't affect the other communities, but it does affect Healdsburg. So is that only uh, the town of Healdsburg? Because I'm at, we're in the out, you know, in the county area. It's just the city of Healdsburg. Okay. It's not the county. Um, okay. So, so that so applies to you, Jerry. <laughs> yeah, so it's this is way better. I got to tell you, I always had a hard time remembering it out. H E nine A. You know, I'm now seven, and that's good, right? So uh, I think this is going to be a bit help. Um, Donna, excuse me, could you say again what uh, at the City of Hillsburg website what department it's under? It's under. Um, I looked it up earlier. It's under Emergency Management. Emergency Management. Okay, thank you. Right, you bet. Um, okay, so Eric Padilla, who is a firefighter with the Northern Sonoma County Fire Protection District, uh, wanted you all to know that they are launching a new community CPR and first aid educational program. Um, and they are going to be presenting classes this month and going forward on first aid and CPR at the Geyserville Fire Station on Saturdays. Um, on May 20th, they start the CPR classes, and on May 27th, the first aid classes. And if you want more information and if you want to sign up, they're free, but if you know, you'll need to register for it. Uh, so you should go to Northern Sonoma County Fire.org. Um, that's their, their website. And then you can click on preparedness and CPR training. And then it'll go uh, the up comes a little um a little calendar and that will show you when the, the various um, sessions are being held. So uh, that's that would be a good thing for you to do. Uh, Dr. Nancy Brown uh, wants you to know about a leadership symposium on July 22nd. So Nancy, why don't you tell us about that? Sure, thank you. So um, the department is sponsoring through some grant funding, uh, what we're calling Better Together Excellence in Neighborhood Preparedness Leadership. and um, this is going to specifically provide information and tools to better engage your community. So our goal is to help you find more new and exciting ways to get people in your neighborhood to say, I definitely want to join COPE. I want to be more active in COPE. I want to be a leader in COPE. So um, all of those types of things. Uh, so not 
uh, preparedness education. Instead, this is more about engagement and how to, and some tools to help you engage better with your community. So this is free to um, our neighborhood leaders in Sonoma County. Um, it's open to everybody in Sonoma County who is working in a neighborhood of 10 or more homes. Um, so I will put the information for you. It is July 22nd. It is from nine to five. Um, there'll be also some great networking opportunities. Um, one of the things that I have been working toward uh, for many years is um, how to connect neighborhoods across the county. So when something's happening in northern Sonoma County, you still have a wider group of people you can reach out to in southern Sonoma County who have who are not currently experiencing an emergency and might be able to help you with resources, information, places to stay, all of those types of things. So this is also a really great opportunity to connect the county together when we're looking at um, emergency preparedness people. So I will um, put the link in the chat for you and um, hope that you all register. We do have a limited number of people. We're at about two thirds full right now. So if it is something you'd like to do, please do. And also if you do register and for something comes up and you can't go, please do cancel your registration so we can keep as many seats open for people who can make it as possible. Thank you so much for your time. You bet. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, does anybody else have an announcement that they wanna uh, share with us? Uh, I put the evacuation zone link in the in the chat. Okay, anyway. great. Good. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, anybody else? Looks like Fred Peterson. Fred, where are you, Fred? I'm not, I'm trying to find you here on my screen. I so, see myself. So, Fred, go ahead. <laughs> there you are. Oh, yeah. I see your hand now. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, uh, two uh, two announcements. First, I want to. Thank Chief uh, Turberville for uh, we had a a um, productive uh, multi agency drill in Knights Valley this past Saturday, working with Healdsburg, Cloverdale, Sonoma County Fire. Uh, we uh, we um, uh, showed people about the GMRS radios, introduced the firefighters. I uh, had a number of the France Valley Cope folks there, so it was. Uh, uh, a good start. The other announcement is that we, um, Northern Sonoma Fire, um, has started the process by resolution to take on the responsibility for veg management and fire prevention in Northern Sonoma. Um, we um, figure we're doing it. It's uh, um, so uh, it's a big leap to to tell everyone that that's what we're taking on but i think we have such a such support and uh leadership that um we believe we can um you know with all of your help make it happen so that's a, i think a big announcement thank you great thank you thank you anybody else yes priscilla um just quickly the newsletter will be going out on thursday um, but I just wanted to I'll let you know that Eric's flyer for his CPR and first aid classes will be in there. Um, and just a, another pitch for his work. You know, he's all about a lot of the emergencies are small things that happen. Your neighbor comes to you because they cut their finger, you know, chopping vegetables for dinner and needs your help. You know, those kinds of things that we run into that are really common. Um, and I appreciate that a number of you have done CERT training and have some first aid, but a lot of us don't. So it's a great opportunity. The second is that um, we were able to find someone to come in as our new engagement specialist. And um, we're super excited to have Kobe joining us. Um, she'll have a very slow ramp up over the next couple of months because she's got prior commitments. Um, but we look forward to working with her. She comes with a lot of preparedness in her background. Unlike um, Elsa, she has that already in place and um, she has a lot of experience with engagement as well. So um, you will be hearing from her probably over the next couple of months in various ways that she'll be reaching out. Wonderful. That's great news. That's really great. Mm -hmm. um, oh. Okay, any other announcements? All righty, let's circle back then to Nancy um, because I think Nancy has got a tip of the month. 
Oh, I actually don't. I apologize. That was my tip of the month. Come to my uh, Better Together <laughs> seminar. Well, oh, that's a good tip. <laughs> that was my tip. My best hot tip. <laughs> Fine. That's great. That's great. Okay, then. So um, I think uh, we're going to do the spotlight. So the spotlight today is Pine Mountain. And I think Marianne's going to walk us through that. Super. Um, first of all, can you see the screen? Yes. Okay, we're in good shape already. <laughs> I had the privilege to interview Steve Nurse, who is co-leader um, co of the Pine Mountain Preston area, which is up on the northeast side of Cloverdale. Um, so Cloverdale sits over here. Um, it's actually evacuation zone. Looks like SON 282. Um, so everyone can see that perfect um so the pine mountain preston area includes um all of pine mountain road um this picture that you see here i actually live at the base of pine mountain and that's my view up of, of pine mountain um it includes pine mountain road uh green road which is actually off of pine mountain and then the preston area off of the north end of geysers road um, it's a unique area. It's large parcels. It's a mix of year-round residents, um, weekend visitors, and parcels without any dwellings at all. Um, in all, there are approximately 100 residents, um, and they have about a 70% COPE participation. Also, what's unique about this area is um, geographically, um, of their their group, 20% are actually in Mendocino County, um, so that's different. Um, so the, this COPE group was uh, formed in September of 2018, oh, dear. and their um, their community leaders are Steve Nurse and his co. Number one. Okay. Wait a minute. Which number, Holly? Was I muted for a while there? Just briefly, yes. Okay. Um, so the COPE group was formed in September of 2018. Uh, the community leaders are Steve Nurse and Michelle Gergit. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Um, they also have six neighborhood leaders, um, and those are Steve Tellez, Kristen Tellez, Ruth Kapinski, Mike Morissette, um, Debbie Platt, and then also Michelle Grigich, again, um, one of the, the neighborhood leaders. So, why did they decide to start a COPE group? Um, first of all, they have massive exposure for residents. I remember um, some, some actually pretty significant fires up there many, many years ago. The properties are remote and they're also inaccessible. Um, Pine Mountain Road is extremely narrow. There's lots of turns and twists. Um, and Green Road off of Pine uh, Mountain is a single track road. Um, both of those roads are in poor repair. Um, so what is this group's focus? For starters, they're not gonna be fighting fires. Um, their, their, their plan is to keep themselves safe. Um, they're, their focus has been to build and maintain relationships with and plan and receive direction um, from the fire department. That's both the Cloverdale Fire Department and the Hopland Fire Department. So both of those fire departments have visited each interested parcel um, and advised on improving their dispensable space and also identifying shelter in place location should that be necessary. Um, what's interesting for these, um, these property owners is the fire department does not want them on the main roads. So if the fire department needs to get up Pine Mountain Road um, or Green to fight a fire, they don't want the residents coming down off the hill and getting in the way. Um, so it's very important that they, that they discover or identified alternative evacuation sites or um, uh, strategies, but also evac evacuation areas. So areas that they would be safe if they could not come down off of the, um, the mountain. 
Um, the other thing that they've set up is GroupMe and Phone Tree during emergencies. So um, GroupMe texts everyone, and the Phone Tree is um, the neighborhood leader just starts calling uh, to make sure that everyone's got um, the information that they need. So they've really prided themselves on the relationships that they've built with the um, with the fire department, um, so that they know they're going to get a call right away with um, what's going on and what it how how to best lead um, their their members. Um, accomplishments, they have identified evacuation areas. Um, they've also worked to develop um, evacuation routes um, to the north through Calpine. Um, there's a very large ranch called Hale Ranch. Um, so they have access through Hale Ranch to the geysers, which then goes over to Healdsburg. And they're currently working with Hopland Fire to evacuate um, to 101. Um, so that's still in progress. Um, so in closing, reflections. Um, when asked why they started a, a COPE group, they said, um, this, I think it was at the suggestion of Supervisor Gore, um, who said, you guys really need to do this. Um, but basically what Steve said is there are no downsides to starting a COPE group, only upsides. Um, definitely they have a level of comfort, knowing they've prepared as much as possible. And the COPE concept really brought awareness and provided a model for them to get to come together and really build community that extends beyond um, beyond during emergencies. Um, their focus continues to be advocating for a ban on campfires in high risk areas. Um, up in their area, again, there's um, uninhabited property and it's a lure for young people to go up and bring their beer and their campfires. And so um, it, it does cause a lot of concern to their neighborhood and, um, and again, do all they can to advocate um, for that. And I think, I know we have Steve here. If Steve has anything else that he would like to share, um, probably now would be the time, Steve. Um, no, I think you've covered it very well, Marianne. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I think you mentioned the fact that we go into Mendocino County, which is why we get Hopland involved. Um, so we're yeah. right on, the, right on the, the county border. Is it, Steve, you know what I wasn't sure, is it both Pine Mountain and Green Road that extend into Mendocino? They both do, yes. Okay, great, thank you. Okay. There's no other questions, I guess that's it. Oh, it looks like Margie. Margie has a question. Forgive me, maybe I missed it, but how many um, residents or groups do you have up on Pine yeah. Mountain City? It sounds better than it is. We've got, it's it's tough to know how many parcels because some people own many parcels. Yes. Okay. But there's a pro, if you think about ownership, there's about a hundred parcels that are owned up here. Okay. Of those, about 60 of them are, have residences on them. And we've got about 70% of those 60 people. Great. So, so Great. We've, got, we've, we've got pretty good coverage. Yeah. Good. Okay. All right. So Marianne, you want to share your screen again? And I am on it. Hold on. All right. Second. Okay. Okay. So I get to start here, and then um, and then Donna will take over. Um, Today we're talking about or sharing age-friendly Sonoma County. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the concept of age-friendly. It is a program of the World Health Organization. Um, the local affiliate is, um, is actually AARP, um, and they call it age-friendly livable communities. Um, so back in 2016, um, realizing in Sonoma County we have a very large um, aging population of, I think it's about, um, out of 490,000 residents, 138,000 are over the age of 60. Um, so we're definitely a graying community. 
and um, and we felt like it was important to make sure that our aging population is well represented, um, has the services that they need, um, and actually the community that allows them to stay connected. Um, so in 2016, um, Sonoma County applied for and and received their um, their age friendly status. Um, actually, the state of California now has its age friendly status, and I believe there are only about 11 states that have done so. Um, there are 11 counties um, that are age friendly in the state of California, and there's actually 65 towns and cities which have received their age friendly. Um, designation as well. Here in Sonoma County, we're well represented in the north with both Windsor and Hillsburg have their age-friendly designation and actually Petaluma does too. And when um, a city or a town applies um, to be age-friendly, they basically commit to a focus on age-friendly practices and a five-year plan. Um, so it's good to know that Sonoma County is doing that. So our mission locally is that Sonoma County is a healthy place to live, work, and play, a place that supports all people to thrive across the lifespan and achieve their life potential. Um, so within that age-friendly um, uh, structure, there are eight domains of livability, and every community is supposed to set goals around those um, domains of livability. Um, so you can see them in front of you as outdoor spaces and buildings, and that's making sure that in outdoor spaces like um, parks, that there's walking trails that are safe, um, that older adults can utilize, and biggie for older adults is restrooms along the way, um, maybe benches for people to be able to sit down, um, making sure that buildings are accessible. So this is really important to planning departments um, within cities and the county. Um, making sure that um, that there's um, you know um, that the stairs are usable or that there's elevators um, or if there's something that someone may frequent regularly maybe have it out on the street um, for instance like a mailbox um, to pay a um, a water bill um, so people don't need to go in and out um, so basically it just means for a planning department um, to to have an age friendly filter and recognize that when they're approving anything, does this work for an 80 year old? Because if it works for an 80 year old, it's gonna work for an eight year old and everyone else in between. Um, the other focus is transportation. 25% um, of us will lose our ability to drive um, during our lifetime. Um, so making sure that we have systems um, that actually help seniors to get around if they lose their ability to drive. And I know here in Sonoma County, buses, um, at least in Santa Rosa, stop at about five o'clock, which means that if you're a senior and you don't drive, you're staying home. Um, housing, making sure that we have suitable housing that's not only affordable, but allows for people to age in place for the duration of their life. Social participation. Um, so think about like if there's a, um, a farmer's market, if it's after hours, maybe a senior wouldn't be able to, um, to, vis to visit because they wouldn't have transportation for that. Respect and social inclusion. Um, so this is the part that really aligns with, um, with COPE, um, making sure that we're including older homebound seniors in our planning efforts. Um, the other is civil participation and employment. Um, are we, do we have an age friendly um, uh, business structure? So do uh, local companies know about the benefits of hiring an older adult? Um, that maybe they don't need healthcare because they've got social security um, and that it could be actually a lower cost of employment, um, but it also could bring a work ethic that you might not get um, in another generation. Um, communication and information. So are we, are seniors receiving all of the information um, that they could if they're not tech savvy? How do they receive information? And are we all thinking about that as we try to um, try to communicate? Um, there, let's see, last one would be community support and health services. So as a nonprofit community um, serving our seniors well, um, are our health um, organizations also 
serving our seniors well. So when you think about an age-friendly community, first of all, it's always about government and what they can do um, in their planning, in their, um, in their, you know, their strategic plan. Does it have include a thought process for what's good for an 80-year-old or an eight-year-old um, when they're putting in stoplights? Are they sure that a crosswalk is going to allow for enough time for a person with a um, with a walker or with a cane? Um, are they going to have enough time to get across? Because if they do, then the mother with the you know the stroller and the toddler um, will have enough time as well. Um, so who can contribute to a, um, an age-friendly community? Clearly it's government, clearly um, healthcare, it's um, nonprofit organizations such as Council on Aging, um, but it's also reliant on a grassroots component. Um, and that means churches, are, are their activities um, meant to be inclusive and meant to support? What about um, service organizations like Rotary and Kiwanis? Um, are they also, um, you know, maybe they have a transportation program within their organization and, and they help, um, you know, homebound seniors come to a meeting. Um, but it also relies on businesses and do they have age-friendly practices? Um, do they allow for places you know, if a senior comes in and shop, they're more likely to shop in the store than a younger generation who actually um, is um, is buying everything online. So um, do they have large signs that someone can read? Do they have places to sit down if someone gets tired? Um, and it is also reliant on, on individuals um, so that we are looking around our neighborhoods and we know who's there, who might be isolated, who might not have any type of support and making it a practice to know those people and to, um, and to look at ways that we might be able to help as well. Um, so back when, um, when Sonoma County um, got their age-friendly designation, um, there was also quite a bit of, um, of surveys and focus groups throughout the county um, to hear from the residents and what their top um, concerns were so that we would know what to address with an age-friendly plan. Um, and it's not a big surprise for most of them. Transportation, clearly. Um, we don't have a great transportation um, uh, system. And um, a lot of people don't live in the middle of um, a walkable community. A lot of us are out in the country. Um, and again, if we lose our ability to drive, that, that's going to be um, pretty critical for all of us. Um, again, housing, and this had more to do with um, is the housing um, close or walkable to, um, to services that they may need, and also is it affordable, which leads right into financial security. Um, most were concerned about um, their, the ability to have their savings um, outlast them. Um, huge concern. And the one that we didn't really, really, really expect was isolation. And that came up big in every single conversation. And it was the concern that um, that they would be left behind in the, in the case of any emergency, that they wouldn't receive information, that they were no longer a valued part of um, the community, that um, they may have been highly productive, lived in this community, contributed for many years, but felt as though they were no longer valued and what they had to offer wasn't needed anymore. Um, so it was, it was a little um, depressing, um, but, but not surprising. And I think we all just read recently that isolation is wor worse for health than a pack of cigarettes per day. Um, so it definitely um, doesn't contribute um, to the well-being of seniors um, here in our county. Um, the interesting part is we, um, the, the age-friendly team, just created the, um, the, the plan um, right here in Sonoma County, right before the, um, the Tubbs fire. And um, it really demonstrated um, what, uh, what the risks were to seniors. I think the majority of those who, who passed during that time were seniors. Um, they... Um, they either lacked transportation, they lacked mobility, um, they, they didn't um, 
maybe had their hearing aids out, didn't hear what was going on, didn't um, smell fire, um, and um, or weren't just weren't able to escape and didn't have the resources to do that. Um, so it really highlighted how vulnerable um, our seniors were. And quite frankly, it was the reason I joined um, the COPE Board of Directors was because the correlation between what COPE was doing and the potential for building community for seniors and ensuring their safety during disasters, it was just in perfect alignment with age friendly. Um, so it was, um, it, it just made total sense. Um, my brother has, um, lives in Sacramento and he used to talk over the fence with his um, elderly um, neighbor. And it was just, you know, if they were both outside, they would strike up a conversation. And um, one day he had a knock on the door and it was the elderly gentleman's daughter. And um, she reached out and she said, I understand you talked to my father. And she said, I wanna give you my information. And she told him what his, she told my brother what her father's challenges were. And she said, um, if you wouldn't mind looking out for him in case of any kind of emergency, I'd really appreciate that. And she shared her contact information. Um, so it, um, it really shows what we can do if we put ourselves out there a little bit. Um, oops, okay, I moved too far. Let me go back the other way. Um, so I think that's just a little bit about, um, about age friendly. And I'm going to um, turn it over to, um, oh, wait a minute, no, I am still on. Okay, sorry, Donna. Um, so neighborhood networks. So this is kind of the correlation between COPE and age friendly. Um, definitely can address isolation by providing communication and information in times of emergency. Um, so if we know that our neighbor can't hear, then we know we're really going to have to pound on the on the windows, or we're going to have to have arranged in advance of how do I how do I get through to you. Um, it totally addresses respect and social inclusion by ensuring they are not left behind. I can tell you we provide the Meals on Wheels program and there's a lot of seniors who are isolated by choice. Um, they, you know, they tend to stick pretty close to themselves. Um, they're, you know, may have been an introvert and it's hard to, to reach out and ask, asking for help is probably one of the hardest things that there is. Um, sometimes, you know, a hoarding situation has occurred or um, cleaning the house is, is harder than it was and they tend to kind of um, shut people out. Um, so there's a real opportunity um, to, to share how we can help each other and, and how meaningful that help can be when needed. Um, also, we can potentially provide transportation, especially um, in times of evacuation. Um, and if it has to happen quickly, um, we can look out for our neighbors that way. So um, now I will turn it over to Donna to continue. <clears throat> Let me go back. Yeah, thanks, Marianne. I think you went, well, yeah, there we go. Yeah, so thank you. Um, so in uh, 2021, uh, Nancy Brown and I uh, did a presentation for this uh, COPE um, leader group on communicating with older people and helping them prepare uh, their own emergency plans. Uh, today, however, uh, Marianne and I decided that we would try to focus on the subgroup of older people who are more vulnerable, uh, who are more isolated, and how POPE groups can identify those folks and work with their existing support networks to help them prepare for and manage in an emergency. So in other words, we don't, as, as neighbors and as COPE groups, we don't want to supplant uh, a functioning support network that exists, what we want to do is we want to support it and augment it and work with it in order to, um, to assist older adults in their planning and in being safe during an emergency. So I, I think it's important to, to say here before we go farther that, that simply age by itself does not mean vulnerability. I mean, a, a number of us here, I'm looking at some of your beautiful faces as I'm looking down in the, uh, in the Zoom and you know, there are a number of us, and as Marianne said, we have a, a fairly um, uh, aging population here in, in the county, but that certainly doesn't mean that we're all uh, vulnerable. It is the case, of course, that older adults are more likely to have functional impairments, mobility issues, or 
hearing or, or other kinds of deficits. But it's also the case that, that most older people do have some resources that can be tapped for emergency preparedness. So the, the challenge in effect for, for us um, as, as part of COPE groups is, is to identify what some of those resources are, strategize with one another as, as neighbors and as COPE groups, and, and figure out what we can do to help people, both help support their networks and help support them, both for education and in times of emergency. You wanna go to the next slide, Marianne? Mm -hmm. So in, you know, we, in gerontology, we tend to think of support networks as kind of arrayed along a continuum. And that continuum ranges from formal at the one end to informal uh, at the other. And the most formal kinds of help that older folks get tends to be Social Security and, and Medicare. Um, and these are programs, obviously, that are pretty much universally um, provided, uh, but they are impersonal, right? Um, now, when I applied for Social Security, I had some questions and I went down to uh, a nice man uh, at the Social Security office on range uh, in Santa Rosa near the Cottingtown Mall, and he was very helpful. And it was great, but let's just say he's not my friend. Okay, so so impersonal, but but wide coverage is the kind of thing that you can look to Social Security and, and Medicare to provide. Also, we have um, government-funded programs through the Older Americans Act, um, and these programs provide local services uh, to people. Uh, these are area agencies on aging, or, or triple A's, and organizations like Council on Aging, like Marianne's um, organization. And these agencies will, will do things for people like, like provide Meals on Wheels programs. Uh, some organizations of this sort provide uh, uh, demand response um, transportation systems for, for people. Sometimes they offer uh, legal services, sometimes financial planning services and a range of, you know, of, of various things. And while they are certainly formal, it's also the case that the people who interact with older adults as clients can sometimes form sort of, in, you know, somewhat more personal relationships uh, with them. Uh, the Meals on Wheels driver, for example, uh, may in fact, over a period of time, develop a nice positive personal relationship with uh, the client that, that he might serve. We also, in that kind of that same vein, we have people who are paid caregivers either through agencies or through private, uh, private pay. They too are paid workers, but at the same time, they too can often develop uh, personal relationships with, with their clients. Uh, then we move into the more uh, informal parts of the support network and kind of the most formal of the informal uh, uh, organizations would be family. Uh, family members are, are clearly informal, but there are certain roles within a, within a family, um, and you wouldn't necessarily look to your third cousin for the same kind of support and assistance that you might look to for, for a daughter, for example. Um, a little less formal, a little more informal would be, would be neighbors um, and, and cope groups as a, as a more organized form of that. Um, the thing about family uh, is that most, most people have some family members. Does not mean, however, that everybody gets along well with their families, right? Um, and it also doesn't mean that family members are necessarily proximate. So if there is an emergency uh, and your daughter lives in Seattle, I mean, that's great, but she's not going to be there uh, to be able to help you. And that's why neighbors and cope groups um, are, are so significant here, I think, in the informal array of services and, and supports because your neighbors are, you know, they are where you are and therefore that's uh, extremely important. And then finally, friends, um, that's sort of the most informal uh, group of potential helpers. And friends can be neighbors um, and neighbors can be friends or your friends can also live um, at great distance. So again, the neighborhood connection uh, is super important here. Uh, you want to move on, Marianne? Yep. So, so in terms of cope groups um, assisting vulnerable older adults, I like to think of this really in, in kind of three parts, uh, preparation, communication, and action. Now, this is a kind of an idealized way of looking at it, and this is not to say that, you know, any given 
you know, Cope Group may follow this exactly, but this is a kind of a game plan in some ways, and it may help to kind of organize your thinking about how you and your Cope Group neighbors can, can proceed. Uh, Marianne, next one. So the first phase then is preparation. And, and I would say that this is really, really a crucial phase. In, in some ways, it may also be the most difficult. Um, and, that, and that is because while most of us, I think in Cope neighborhoods, we probably know who might be more isolated um, and vulnerable, but the challenge is how to approach these people and how to engage them um, and how to you know, encourage them to take advantage of the kind of tools and, and resources that we have available to help them. And so there isn't really any, any you know, one formula or, or any one recipe for, for how to engage um, uh, older adults, vulnerable older adults, people especially who are isolated. Um, it, it, can be, it can be very challenging. And, and I think that to some degree, you know, we have to recognize the fact that one of the reasons sometimes people are, you know, isolated and therefore vulnerable is that they don't want to be engaged. <laughs> I mean, they don't necessarily seek out um, engagement with other people and they don't necessarily welcome it when uh, assistance or, or help is offered. So, you know, we, we kind of have to be mindful of that. And that's the case, whether it's, it's a more formal um, uh, program uh, that you know that we've been talking about or whether it's an informal program i mean i'm sure m most of us have had the experience of you know of wanting to tell our uh, older uh, relatives our moms or our dads that they really ought to do something take some action but you know they may say forget it you know sorry i'm not going to do that and and that kind of gets us to this issue of, of what is an ethical dilemma really that social service providers and healthcare providers encounter all the time. And that's the issue of autonomy versus beneficence. In other words, even though you may think you have, you know, a great strategy for, for helping someone out, if, if they prefer not to be helped and they reject that help, then their autonomy in a sense really does have to be respected unless they have severe cognitive impairment. And then that's a whole different, uh, a whole different ball game. So this is not easy, right? It, it is complicated. But I think we can think about some strategies that we can do to, to try to approach and engage um, more vulnerable and isolated older folks in our neighborhood. The first one, the first strategy I, I would suggest is, no, we go back. I'm not done, Marianne. With okay. <laughs> We're still on preparation. We're on the determine the best way to approach. Um, and, and I think, the best way uh, to approach someone is not necessarily to just go up and knock on the door. I mean, that may work for some people, but it's probably not going to work for um, for a lot of people. And for one thing, you know, you shouldn't assume that your that your neighbor who is sort of isolated and vulnerable will they even recognize you as being a neighbor. You know, maybe not. And uh, it also is the case that they may have the the daughter in Seattle who says, "Mom, never answer." Never answer the door if it's a stranger, if you don't know who's knocking on the door. And, you know, I mean, that makes a certain amount of sense. So rather than just simply going up and saying and trying to knock on a person's door and say, you know, I'm here, I'm part of this COPE group, I want to give you some education and some information. What I would do is I would try first to sort of uh, smooth the way, okay, uh, to do some to do a little bit of, of preparatory work before you take the step of knocking on the door. And I'd use, what I would do is I'd use one of these neat Coke uh, information pieces. I'm holding one up, you can see it here on my little square. This is the one that says, uh, neighbors helping neighbors. And there's a place here where you can fill out your evacuation zone and your neighborhood leader. And there's a phone number that goes here. And on, on the other side, there are some resources for people. There's um, some alert, uh, information about alerts. Uh, there's information about, um, in the case of an emergency that's ongoing, uh, the phone numbers for fire departments, et cetera. There's radio stations that people can access for, for information. So I put this in a person's mailbox or I stick it under the mat on their front door and I'd attach you know, a little note or something or a little sticky note that says, 
you know, I'm your neighbor, so and so, be sure and tell them where you live so they, they know that, in fact, you are a neighbor and that you'd like to stop by, let's say, on Wednesday and give them a little more information and just get to know them better and talk about this a little bit. All right. Now, that may not necessarily mean that the person will open the door for you, but it, it might. I mean, just reaching out a little bit, you know, with something like this uh, could potentially uh, get you through the door. And that's really uh, that's really what you want to do. So um, so if that doesn't work, if you put this in a person's mailbox or under their mat and you go on Wednesday and you knock on the door and they still ignore you, um, then at least you have provided them with some some useful information, even if, uh, if even if you don't get past uh, that that first point. Um, another possible strategy is a little more indirect, and this one is to use the person's informal support network, at least what you can figure out about it, or or the or the network of providers who may provide them with services through programs such as COA or or the AAA. Um, so one of the things about about people who are isolated is that they're usually not completely isolated. There are people, um, there are people who will who will come and go. And one of the best things about being a neighbor is that you can watch that coming and going, right? I mean, we all see people coming into our neighborhood to provide services for for our neighbors. And so, you know, you'll know, for instance, if you're watching, kind of, if 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 there is a regular Meals on Wheels delivery or if there's maybe a home health care worker that comes, or, or if there's you know, a house cleaner who shows up. And maybe there's someone who comes and goes fairly regularly who might be a friend or who might be a family member. And so what you can do is you can try to reach out to um, someone like that. Uh, you can approach them. You can certainly identify yourself, let them know that you're a neighbor and you're engaged with COPE and it you have some concerns about this person's safety and you'd like to be able to provide them with information and then, you know, find out if that individual could work with you at all. I mean, you don't want to put a worker in a situation where, you know, they, they compromise their position and they, they can't be in a, in a situation where, you know, they, they betray any confidences or anything like that. But, you know, short of that, there may be ways that you can kind of work with uh, people who who in fact do have contact with the older person in your neighborhood. Um, another strategy is to be really, to take advantage of opportunities that just you know, show up serendipitously, right? Um, for instance, in, in, in my neighborhood, um, my neighbors next door, I, I, I know that they would be able to evacuate in the case of an emergency, They're, they would be fine about transportation, but I'm worried, I worry about them I think they're kind of digitally challenged, you know? I mean, I'm not sure that they're, I wasn't sure that they were really getting alerts. I didn't know for sure if they were really tracking on the group B list uh, for our, our Pope group that, that they're on. So they walk their dog and, they, and the dog walking is pretty scheduled. I mean, that dog is out there at certain times, right? So I paid attention to when that walking happened and on one occasion, I went out to the mailboxes and when the dog walking was taking place, I talked to them about, about being in contact to let them know about red flag warnings, um, to make sure they were signed up for Nixol and the other kinds of, of SoCo alert. And, and they were pretty much, but they had somehow managed to fall off the group me list, right? They were not getting uh, the group me information that I was sending. So I helped them, you know, get back on the group me list. And so, so again, it's it's just kind of taking advantage of an opportunity uh, that that presents itself. Um, uh, Marianne uh, mentioned uh, her her brother in um, in Sacramento and the fact that uh, the daughter of this neighbor came over and approached him. You know, we can think of these kinds of things as little gifts, right? Um, so in this case, someone in the person's support network um, approached approach the neighbor with, uh, with asking maybe for some help and, and assistance in monitoring. And, and much sort of the same kind of thing happened in, in, in my neighborhood, in our COAP group. Uh, we have a neighbor who is, is isolated and she's quite vulnerable. She has mobility impairment. She lives alone. Um, she, have, may, she may have some 
mild cognitive impairment um, as well. Uh, she does have a, su a support system. She has a daughter and a, uh, a grandson who, who live also in Healdsburg, but they live on the other side of town, right? Um, they are engaged. They do come over. I'll call her Maggie. They come over to Maggie's house and they check in on her. And so on, on one occasion, um, Sharon, who is my, my uh, neighborhood cope co-leader who happens to live next door to Maggie, she made a contact with uh, this with the daughter when she was over visiting one day and said, you know, I'm part of COPE and we'd like to kind of watch over your mom and make sure that, you know, things are all right. Well, you know, Jane, the daughter was thrilled. I mean, she was really happy that there were, you know, neighbors that were interested and willing to, you know, support and provide assistance. So we shared contact information. Jane now is on you know, our group me lists, she's on our text message list, she gets all the information that I send, you know, to all of the, all of the, the COPE neighbors. So again, this is a way of using the existing support network, in this case, the daughter and the grandson, to help in planning. And I also think, you know, Jane doesn't happen to live in a neighborhood where there's a COPE group. So I think we were also able to, to educate Jane, <laughs> to some extent, about, you know, some of the principles of, of, hope and home hardening and other things that she can do uh, as far as her own residence is concerned. But, but what I'm saying though is, you know, this is challenging. Um, you've got to kind of be open to opportunities, um, sort of prepare the way if you're going to try to contact a person directly. And you also can try to think creatively how you can use the support system that the person already has in place, whether that's formal or informal. Okay, next slide now. Uh, Marianne, next slide, please. Hold on. It's like stuck. Okay. That's because I talked too long on this slide. Here we but go. That's really an important slide. <laughs> All right. Why don't you go back one? There we okay. go. Communication. So communicating with older adults was really a focus of our uh, 2021 program. So I'm not going to say a lot about it, about it here. Um, but um, in general, I'll say that if you get through the door at some point, you know, whether through your own efforts or, or the help of uh, someone in the person support network, um, what you want to do is you want to assume that you will have more than one meeting and you want to establish a kind of a nice friendly rapport with the person. Um, you want to keep things simple. Don't lay a lot of information on them all at once at, all, at the first meeting. Uh, relax. Don't rush through this. And and remember that what your, what your purpose is really for this first meeting is you want to find out more about their situation. Rather than trying to tell them information, you're trying to gather information from them. Find out what their support network looks like, find out who's in it, find out how they perceive their situation, and, and see what they can tell you. Uh, and actually, this part of it, uh, unlike the first part, which is difficult, this is kind of fun. Often when, when you start talking to people, they like talking to you, you know, they want to tell you about themselves and, and their situation. So this can really kind of be an enjoyable experience all around uh, when you kind of begin the communication process. Okay, next slide. So I would start, you might take the whole evac pack, but I would start at this first meeting by focusing on the personal emergency plan. Um, and specifically, you can go to the next slide now, Marianne. Um, specifically, I would go to the contact, contact information section. And you can see here that, that this section has a, a little chunk here on who to call for assistance. And so you want to know more about that. You want to know, uh, are there neighbors? Are there caregivers? Are there family and friends? I mean, who are the people in the person's network? Um, okay, next slide. And, and then you want to flesh this out, right, uh, by asking the person some specific questions uh, to get to get at it more. Um, you can observe and have a, some sense for what the person's living situation is like. You'll obviously know whether they live alone or with others, but you can ask them things like, do you know any of your neighbors? Um, do you use community, community services like Meals on Wheels? Do you drive or do you use other transportation? Um, is there somebody you would turn to in an emergency? Do you have family uh, who live in your town or where do they live? And there may be a lot of other uh, questions uh, like that that will occur to you as you kind of go through this first conversation. So again, it's really getting to know the person and getting a better sense for what their 
support network, formal and informal, looks like. Okay, we can go on. Um, so now we come to the action items. And before you leave that first meeting, it would be a really good idea to set up a specific date and a time for a second meeting uh, with the older person. And you should be sure to ask if there were any individuals who were mentioned by them um, in this conversation that you could ask to join in. Um, and if you can contact them, offer to do that, uh, to ask them to join in for the next meeting. Again, this has the effect of, of enhancing the person's uh, support network and using the support network rather than trying to substitute for what already exists. Um, then I'd say the, the, the next step would be to gather together some of the COPE neighbors to evaluate uh, what this person has had to say about their support system. Um, were, were the responses reasonable? I mean, what does that network look like? If the person tells you that they have a couple of sons, but the sons live in Akron, then you know that the, maybe the COPE group and the neighbors will have to take a more, a more active role um, in helping this person. And brainstorm uh, with your neighbors about, um, about what uh, some of that assistance might look like. And I might even suggest that uh, this could con conceivably be a, a topic for one of your annual meetings. Um, I know some of, some of your COPE groups meet more frequently than annually. But uh, regardless, um, maybe this is a topic, especially if you have more than one uh, vulnerable older adult who's sort of isolated in your, um, in your uh, neighborhood and your community, then maybe you could talk about several of them and try to figure out you know, what the neighbors could do and what the COPE group could do to provide assistance. Okay, next slide. So at the second meeting um, and perhaps subsequent meetings with the older adult and maybe with um, some of the members of his or her support network, um, come together, um, talk more about the options for getting prepared in an emergency. This may be the point when you want to go through uh, other sections of that personal emergency plan. There's a lot of great stuff there about go bags and sheltering in place and all that. So introduce some of those topics. But what I would do also um, is I would really focus on the evacuation section um, of that personal plan. Uh, and then there's also an evacuation timeline and checklist. Uh, Marianne, you want to go to the next? The, the reason I'm suggesting you focus here on the evacuation section is because that was one of the specific concerns that was, were raised by people in, in the focus groups and in the surveys that they did. They were afraid of being, you know, left behind, basically, in, uh, in an emergency situation and in an evacuation um, situation. So, um, so what you really want to do here, I think, is you want to focus on that, really sort of do a, a good deep dive into where they would go for help, who they would call on, who could be helpful to them uh, among, among neighbors um, um, to, to assist them. Okay, uh, next slide. And before you are done, whether it's the second meeting or the third or fourth meeting or however many, what you wanna do is you wanna engage the person in a summary conversation. Um, you wanna make sure that the, that the older person has a really good grip on who's gonna help them, who they call, you know, how they proceed in the, in the case of an emergency. Um, I talked about this a little bit when, when Nancy and I did our, our presentation in, in 2021. Uh, but in this case, I think it's especially important that you, you, you talk mm -hmm. about this and you do this summary because what you wanna do is you wanna um, make sure the older person you know, understands that, that in fact, there are people who are available to them to help in an emergency and that they do have resources um, and that there are people they can count on and they won't be left behind um, in an emergency. And, Understanding that, I think, and, and knowing that really is empowering. Um, and so this is a really good way to kind of end that series of conversations with, uh, with the older person, plus just making sure that they, they know who to call and who to contact or who's going to be in touch with them when an emergency happens. Okay, next, please. Next slide. Yeah. For some reason, when I'm using it, it's sticking. Okay. There we go. So 
we want to close the loop, right? And we want to get back to the COPE neighbors who have talked about, you know, the isolated, vulnerable, uh, older person in, in their midst. And, and we want to review with the neighbors uh, what the older adult action plan is, is going to be and who the appropriate people are in, in the network that will help them. And we want to clarify various roles, um, who's going to help, uh, who the backups are. As, as I mentioned, um, my, my co-leader in, in our neighborhood has been in touch with her neighbor, um, who's vulnerable, with her, her neighbor's daughter. And if there was an emergency, she would certainly call Jane, right, and for evacuation. But what happens if Jane can't get there? Well, then in those situations, Sharon is going to pick up Maggie and drive her to safety, right? But what we realized on, on one occasion when we were talking is, you know, what happens if Sharon isn't there? I mean, Sharon doesn't stay, you know, in her house 365 days out of the year, uh, 24 hours a day. So, so if Sharon isn't available, then who? And there are others in, in the neighborhood across the street, you know, who could fill this role, but, but we have to know who's going to do what and when. And so this is the purpose then of, of making sure that the COPE neighbors understand who's going to be helpful. And I'm reminded uh, here of uh, the sad situation that I know was in the, in the paper. This was about the, the gentleman in Geyserville who fell. Some of you may have read about him. He fell and he you know, laid on the floor of, of you know, his home for four or five days before someone found him. And, and you know, eventually, as a consequence of that, um, he died and everyone felt awful. He really had a kind of a pretty darn good support network of neighbors and, and, and friends. But for one reason or another, nobody really checked in or kind of, you know, things, people were out of town or, you know, things sort of fell between the cracks. So that's the kind of thing we want to make sure does not happen, right? That people really are cognizant of, of what their roles are um, and, and who's going to provide backup. If, if there's an emergency situation. And if someone can't be contacted, then we, you know, we would need to know who the next person is that would be um, in line to, to try to help out. And, and finally, it's important to revisit this plan periodically because circumstances change. Uh, just, like, you know, just like every year we replenish our go bags or we cut down vegetation around our houses because vegetation grows. Well, people's support networks will change, their informal network. Um, hopefully, Medicare and Social Security will always be there, knock on wood, but um, people will leave. Um, people will, will leave, they'll move away. However, other folks may, may reappear uh, on, on the scene who can be enlisted uh, in, a, in a support network. So it's important to kind of revise it and review it periodically to make sure that all of the pieces are still in place to you know, to take care of someone um, should an emergency happen. Okay, next slide. And this is the breakout rooms. So we want you to kind of think about and to discuss some of, some of these ideas. And especially, Marianne, I thought it would be a good idea to have you focus on what I talked about a lot as sort of the hardest part of this. And that's how to identify, how to contact uh, vulnerable, isolated people in your in your neighborhood and in your community. You know, have you been able to engage with these folks? Um, has it worked? Uh, if you if you have, what strategies did you use? Um, and you know, what strategies might you brainstorm that that you think might be successful uh, with someone in in your neighborhood who's vulnerable and isolated? Okay, so um, we're going to do breakouts. Do we know how to do that? Someone's going to do that. Uh, we do know how to do that. Okay. Um, the only thing is, is I don't think I put the question, I don't know how to put the question in well, the- Well, that's okay. Uh, the, the, the questions are, are simply, you know, do you have vulnerable people in your neighborhood? Have you been able to identify them? You know, how did you do that? And have you been able to engage with them um, in terms of uh, helping them plan for uh, emergency situations? I mean, that's it, you know, what, what strategies do you think might work? Okay, so we're going to break out into four different rooms, and I think we'll take 10 minutes so that we can come back together and talk about it afterwards. Are there enough people for how many rooms? Uh, we've got three to four in every, I think we have four in every room. Okay, cool. 
Okay, and we're going to automatically close after 10 minutes and regroup. So see you in your rooms. Well, um, let's see, it's about 10 to five. Maybe we could take five minutes and um, have someone from every group, you know, give us what the best strategies were or ideas or something that's worked for your area. Um, I think in room one, Aaron and Judith, are they back? Yes. Could someone from that group give us a little bit of an update? I think we're going to have to come off mute. No? Okay. Whoop. Oh, you had it now, Margie. <laughs> Unmute. Perfect. Okay. You can hear me now. Right. Perfect. We, um, uh, we, we talked about a lot of different situations. Um, one, uh, not that we had up here in the country as many elderly people, but um, we have had a couple of incidences where we've been in touch with family, and that has worked out quite well. Um, but we also have the situation with part-time people, and uh, we try to think about partnering, full-time people partnering with part-time people, so that when they are here, somebody knows it. Um, and have a buddy system. And we're going to work on that again before fire season in Northeast Geyserville. And we like the idea, I like the idea of the dog walking, going and meeting people when they're out walking their dog. <laughs> if you take a treat and you like dogs, <laughs> it's an easy way to talk to people. So, Thank Judith, you. do you want to add anything for your area? I don't think so, Margie. You really covered it well. Okay. Um, we seem to have the same concerns, uh, but I love your ideas. The, the dog walking, it always opens people's minds. Yeah. Great. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Looks like room two, I know Diane. Um, uh, Linda, Jeff and I were, uh, and Linda has had real success just going out uh, uh, distributing materials, you know, like Nancy's great at backpacks and leaving a, um, you know, contact information. And she said, you know, even someone who is deaf, who's very concerned about this, got in touch with her. She, she went from 40 contacts to 80 or something. So just, you know, to reach a lot of people different ways and also reaching out to family has worked for others. Um, in my community, we have, um, we had a buddy system and then we really that wasn't quite right so we hit we people are, are just voluntarily have grouped in groups of three residents and some are full-time and some are part and it's just a way if you are going to be out of town or you you know if you if you're not there if you can let the two other buddies to so you have two buddies to reach every for you know each resident and so groups of three and so that that works to keep people so we know so we know who's here and who's not people travel a lot too even though this might be their permanent residence great that's, that's it thank you in room three i know there another linda and I think diane maybe and jerry and jerry thank you yeah, we didn't have much to add to that. <laughs> we were we were talking about the uh, vacation homes too because it's becoming in Healdsburg. It's becoming quite the the thing, unfortunately. So we have probably we have three vacation homes in our neighborhood, and and they're all they're all cope members. I mean, as soon as as soon as they move in, we we contact them and get them on cope. But the partner thing sounds like a good idea. Great. Okay, so in room four, that one I didn't get to write down. So I'm guessing it was me, um, uh, uh, Steve, and Pat. So Steve Perfect. or Pat should uh, report. He's not moving, so I'll 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 take it. Um, the I the two points that I walked away from 
or with were one of mine just that, that some folks who don't want to be um they don't want to join things uh and and may not may not want to join up it, because they think you're going to want to come over with cookies and and meet with them every few weeks and 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 talk and and be a pal that to let them know up front um all we're talking about here is to get some information so that we can help you if something happens um, get those family contacts that the network how to get in touch with someone if something goes goes awry um, and let them know that we're just you know here to support you if something if something happens and you can annually go and and review that information with them um, and the other point was um, though you can't really officially do it uh, our postal worker is um, on Fitch Mountain knows everybody yeah. and um, though you can't you know, officially use them as a source of information or as a as an interpreter or an introducer. Um, they are um, someone who can help you if you. They know they can let you know the postal worker that hey, you know, um, Maggie's mail's kind of piling up in her mailbox. Has anybody seen her? Or you could in turn ask the mailman, hey, is her mail piling up? I haven't seen her for a couple of days. Um, so it's just using those those folks who are on the mountain or in your neighborhood regularly. That was right. it. You know, Pat, you have a divided household because you were a big old no on the cookies and Priscilla was a yes, as was our group. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we'll work through that. So then um, actually Nancy and Priscilla and I made up another group. Nancy had a good point um, that I'd love for you to share. Sure, happy to. So um, my comment was that sometimes people hesitate to um, offer rides and evacuation because their concern is that they're offering to take care of that person for two or three weeks, however long the evacuation lasts, because they're putting them in their car and they're taking them with them. Um, but, but absolutely not the case. What you are is offering a ride. You are welcome to take that person to the county shelter or evacuation point. And at that point, we will take over from there, try to reach their family, take care of their medical needs and all of those things. You do not have to make a commitment to care for that person until they can return back home. So I think people feel a lot more comfortable that they're just offering a ride to get somebody to safety. And that's pretty easy for most of us to do. Great, thank you, Nancy. Priscilla, is there anything else you wanted to share? Um, I think we came up with a few other strategies, but what I'd like to do is, is as I had mentioned with Marianne, is let's make a list of all these great strategies and distribute them out after the, after the meeting, because we've really had a nice brainstorm, I think, of ideas. You know, I, I actually thought, you know, that I would take Pat's freshly baked cookies and take them over to somebody's house and, <laughs> and be the person to say, hey, you know, I have these cookies, here's a Coke survey, that then maybe the next time you come back and say, did you like those chocolate chip? Because he's really happy to make you oatmeal raisin next time, <laughs> you know, and build that relationship as I need to based on my husband's baking skills. Um, and, and the idea that, you know, somebody's out walking their dogs and you ask them, hey, does Coco have a way out if there's an evacuation and not focus on them, but on their pet? People, you know, prioritize their pet over themselves a lot of times and, and don't want to talk about their issues, but maybe they'll care about Coco and making sure that Coco gets out okay. A good one. Great. Okay, great conversation. That's a great idea. Yep. Donna, anything else you had in closing? It looks like we're coming. No, right no, out. just that, you know, what I think would be super helpful in the same way that we, you know, had good conversations as we broke out in, in, in the groups here. To the extent that you can do this kind of thing among your own neighbors in your own Coke groups as you think about folks, you know, in your in your neighborhood who may need some help or assistance who may be more vulnerable. This is exactly the kind of thing, you know, exactly the kind of thing that, you know, I was sort of suggesting would, would be good to, to sort of brainstorm uh, with your neighbors about what's likely to work and, and understanding that what's going to work for Maggie may not work for Sarah, <laughs> you know, and that, yeah. you know, and you need to 
not only know something about them, but something about their networks. And that's what all this process is designed to do is to try to help you know more about them so that you can use that network effectively. Great. Oh, Priscilla? Yeah, I just, if, if you guys are done, I have a segue to the next meeting. Done. done. Okay. So one of the ways that you might contact some of our more vulnerable people is to give them an air purifier. Okay. And we have air purifiers that we could bring to some of these more vulnerable neighbors. So okay. if you know of neighbors that you can contact via the air purifier idea, let me know and we'll, I will bring them to the next meeting and have them there for you when we talk about smoke ready for a few minutes. And then, drum roll please, we're going to play with GMRS radios. So we're going to have an opportunity to get radios in the hands of most of you, or at least put us in groups with radios and start to play with them and potentially introduce them to your code communities as a, as a method of communication when nothing else works. I hope that sounds interesting to you. We will be meeting again at the Geyserville Fire Station in June. Um, and I believe that's the 19th. Do I have that right, you guys? Uh -huh. All right. I am looking forward to seeing you all and be sure and, and let your co community leaders know about it and I hope to have a robust meeting. Thank you for being here. And Reggie, the couch potato, thanks you for coming. <laughs> great. Okay. Thank you. Thanks Bye -bye. to Donna and Marianne for a great meeting. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Bye -bye. Take care, everyone. Bye bye. bye. bye.